much um, for joining us. This is Northern Virginia Family Practice. Um, this is our town hall series, and I'm Dr. Cecily Havert. Um, I am here tonight to um, host a very, very special um, speaker and uh, where we'll be discussing a great topic. Um, Dr. Domenica Rubino is somebody that I met maybe about a year ago, and we've had many opportunities to chat um, just about um, medicine and you know what she's doing, and it's just it's been it's been an honor to get to know you and and um, and see what you do for for patients. So um, I'm going to go ahead and give a little introduction here um, because it's quite impressive here. Dr. Domenica Rubino is a board certified is board certified in obesity medicine, endocrinology, and uh, diabetes and metabolism, and internal medicine. She received training in both clinical and molecular biological research at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, Dr. Rubino has received several investigator awards and has written articles in several peer-reviewed publications. She currently serves as a clinical expert on the treatment of obesity for several professional committees and has also served as a representative to Congress and outside organizations for the Obesity Society. She is currently also the director of the Washington Center for Weight Management and Research, where she sees, where she sees patients and conducts clinical research. She often speaks as an advocate for the person struggling with obesity and has a strong interest in the psychological impact and societal stigma of this medical condition. And this is one of the reasons that I um, admire and respect Dr. Rubino also just for the last, for everything she's accomplished, but also for addressing the psychological impact of, of this on our overall health. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Domenica Rubino to tonight's town hall. Well, thank you, Cecily. I appreciate that quite a bit. And I appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk with everybody. And, you know, Cecily and Natasha asked me to come in and could I to speak about the injectable medications. So tonight we're just sort of focused on, I'm going to give a brief overview of obesity and some of the important aspects that we look at when we're treating somebody. Uh, and then we're going to focus on the GLP-1 agonist tonight. There's a lot of different medications that are available but there's been a lot of attention uh, to Wagovi in particular, and also it's sort of kid sister Saxenda. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, send questions to Cecily, uh, anything that is of interest and we can stop and we can do that. These are my disclosures. So the key principles of teaching obesity is kind of a little bit of a rough outline, but the main goal of why we treat obesity, there's a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is to treat its associated complications, right? And many of us are really aware that there are certain complications that go along with obesity, which we'll talk about in a second, but they can be structural, they can be metabolic, et cetera. Currently, the medical goal is to lose five to maybe 20% if we can with medication, although uh, there will be the development of other medications that will target greater amounts of weight loss. And we know that losing about 10% can really lower a person's cardiovascular risk. We know that there's a lot of different factors that drive weight, and we're going to talk about those. We also know that treatment is chronic, and you'll probably hear me say this a couple of times tonight. It's really important to understand that treating obesity is not like treating an infection. If you get an infection, you get an antibiotic, and you're presumably done in seven to 14 days, sometimes three, depending on the infection. The treatment of obesity doesn't work that way. It's very complicated from a physiology standpoint, the endocrine regulation, as well as all the changes that take place in your life. So we're gonna be talking about those. There are more than two medications available now. We have many more medications than when I started in this field. And also I really wanna underscore that these are serious medications and it's for a serious disease and complications. When we talk about this, we're not talking about cosmetic use of the medications. So as I was starting to say, obesity is associated with multiple medical issues, right? And so we kind of break it down into some different aspects, but there are the metabolic issues, which many of you may be familiar with, the things we often hear about, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol, heart disease, congestive heart failure, strokes, et cetera. Diabetes is very common. And in fact, prediabetes is very common. So in our clinics, we will see a lot of people with prediabetes. It is important as a health concern to treat anything to help your prediabetes, right? Because we know four to 9% of people every year go on to develop diabetes. 
and is associated with blood clots, asthma, fatty liver disease is becoming a big risk. Fatty liver disease increases your risk for inflammation of the liver, which can then lead to fibrosis and cirrhosis. And so it's going to be one of the new medical conditions that we really focus on over the next 10, 20 years, trying to prevent that. Some cancers are associated with it as well as infertility, et cetera. Additionally, we have mechanical and mechanical overlaps with inflammatory. Sleep apnea is very commonly associated with obesity, chronic back pain from a mechanical standpoint, carrying that pain, various osteoarthritis, uh, knee problems, hip problems, et cetera, affecting incontinence, et cetera. So some of you may actually suffer from some of these things. And also we have now realized, and as, as um, Cecily was starting to say, there's an incredible stigma associated with having excess weight and the stigma alone can aggravate or cause depression. We know there's a bi-directional relationship between depression and weight, all right? So people who are, who are more likely to be depressed either from medication or the depression of not going out, not moving, sleeping a lot, et cetera, can be associated with uh, excess weight or with obesity, but obesity itself can also be associated with depression. We also know anxiety is associated with obesity as well. And in fact, it's probably even more common in my clinic that I see people are suffering from anxiety and actually maybe treating their anxiety with food or alcohol or both. So, but how much weight do we need to lose, right? So we deal with this all the time. We need to have realistic expectations because as I go through this, you'll realize it's, it's very difficult. There's a lot of control over weight that we don't have control over, right? So we may have some control over our environment. We're gonna talk about genetics, but what we do know and what I'm showing in this diagram is first of all, even 5% weight loss can make a difference. It can improve blood sugar. And for some people it can improve their blood pressure, okay? But five to 10%, we can actually, in many people with prediabetes, prevent type two diabetes. We can make some improvement in terms of fatty liver disease, et cetera. And you can see as we go up with the degrees of weight loss, we get more and more improvement. Now that we have medication that can actually result in greater than 10, 15% of weight loss, we're starting to actually be able to make dents for people's medical conditions like improving incontinence, improving sleep apnea, improving pain and functioning with knee arthritis, et cetera. And you can see, obviously, you know, more is better as humans. We like to do more is better, but you can see even with 15%, we're not saying that a person has to lose 30, 40% of their weight, all right? And this is important because we wrestle with a lot of expectations of where a person needs to be. We wrestle from that as from a physician standpoint, but also the person themselves who's suffering from it, right? And we're besieged by a lot of different messages in society as well. Um, this is a little bit of a complex thing, but basically when they did a, a trial looking at people with type two diabetes who are at increased cardiovascular risk, and this is just lifestyle, this is not with medicine. What they found is a critical uh, point to reduce cardiovascular disease was to lose about 10%. And what that means is based on your baseline body weight. So if you weigh 200 pounds, it means a weight loss of 20 pounds. Now, for many of you who are 200 pounds, you say, well, I don't want to just lose 20 pounds. <laughs> I want to lose 40 pounds or whatever. But keep in mind that if you could lose 10%, that's going to actually decrease your risk quite a bit. And that's not being you know, a slacker. That's actually very significant weight loss. And it's important to realize that. So this is kind of a arrow diagram just to sort of set the stage. The AOM stands for anti-obesity medications. And in our field, no one can agree on what to call them yet, but currently it's called that, but probably it will be called something else. And what you can see down in the bottom is lifestyle medication, just diet and lifestyle. On the average, people may be able to lose 5% or maybe 7%, but that is like super successful with lifestyle change. We know when we add medications, we can start to scoot people from 7% to 10% weight loss. And I don't have it in here, but Wagovi, which we're going to talk about shortly, is helping move that arrow to 15% or even 20%. And the purple arrow is showing where the future of research is going. So we've learned a lot from gastric bypass. And in case you don't know this, um, we used to think gastric bypass just had to do with making the stomach smaller, right? 
But we now know that the reason why gastric bypass is successful is because food is routed to a lower part of the intestine. And then there are different hormones that get released that they'll tend the brain, not as hungry, improve insulin sensitivity, et cetera. So gastric bypass is actually considered an endocrine operation now because we're changing hormonal status. And because we change hormonal status, we actually get greater weight loss. And so you see where that purple arrow is. It's trying to push medical therapy to get caught up with the results we might see with bypass or even sleeve, right? And we know for some people we can get 25, 30% with surgery. And that's where the development of these medications is going. All right. Because not everybody wants surgery. Not everybody can have surgery, et cetera. So I threw this up here because a lot of people seem to think this is the case that you just have to have willpower to lose weight and you just need to eat less and exercise more. And hopefully at the end of this, you will understand that it is not that simple. And this is why it is such a struggle. And this is why people who struggle with weight really do struggle. 70% of our country is overweight. So I really don't think 70% of our country is having a willpower issue. So we're gonna start looking at a few diagrams. And I think what's really important to understand is you've got a sort of silhouette of a brain here with a little scale. The brain is doing a balancing act. And I'm going to show you in a couple of slides that the brain is getting feedback from the rest of the body and it's making decisions. Am I hungry? Am I full? What's going on? All right. And that's going to affect what we call homeostasis. Do we need fuel or do we not need fuel? Do we need to eat? Do we need to expend energy? What do we need to do? All right. And We'll talk a little bit about energy expenditure. There's a bunch of words down there, but we'll get to that uh, in a second. So first of all, what a lot of people may or may not realize is there's a very, very strong genetic predisposition to where you are in the spectrum of weight, to where you might be susceptible. So people who come from a family where mom or dad or one side or the other side really struggled with weight, you're going to be more apt to have a struggle with weight. Now you may not, we see families where one sibling gets mom's genes and the other sibling gets dad's genes and they both don't really like it, especially when they're sisters, all right? So one person may have more problem than the other. Sometimes it's more diffuse, everybody seems to struggle and that'll be affected by environment. But it's very, very important to understand the genetics. And we know from genetic trials that identical twins, twins that share DNA, will be the same weight, even if they're raised apart, very, very similar weights, even when they're 60 and 70 years old. And they're really remarkable pictures. These pictures over on the left show monozygotic twins that share their identical twins and their weights and their phenotype, as we say, the way their body looks is very similar, all right? Fraternal twins, just like siblings. And so you can see some big differences between them, okay? Over on the right, we don't really need to get into that, but how we learned a lot about genetics is there are actual abnormalities in genes, one gene abnormality that can actually have, and these are, these are children, but make a change which causes them to be extremely overweight. They're, they never feel satiated, et cetera, results in other hormonal uh, abnormalities. We now know that about 4% of adults who have morbid obesity, have what we call monogenic obesity. And there's people doing research to try to identify those things. And, and there is a medicine that may target some of those pathways. Um, and currently, actually, if you're interested, and I can get the information to Cecily, you can actually do free genetic testing with a company to see if you have any of these abnormalities. But typically, someone started out as a young child with a, with a lot of weight. So I'm gonna, so understand there's a strong genetic role. And now the brain gets feedback from a lot of different places. We now know there's a lot of different hormones that come from the gut that tell the brain hungry, full, et cetera. And those are just abbreviations down there. You guys don't have to know all the info, but understand that signals are coming from the, the gastrointestinal tract all the time. We now know that fat cells are an endocrine organ when I was in medical school, we thought fat cells just stored fat and that's all it did and didn't do a whole heck of a lot. However, we now know 
that it, and more than leptin, but leptin was the first hormone that was really identified. Hormonal signals are coming and are telling the brain, this is the state of energy reserve. So when a person loses weight, one of the reasons why they start getting hungry and start wanting to eat more is because of alterations of hormones coming from the fat cells telling the brain, hey, mayday. So part of your brain doesn't think it's great. You may feel terrific in some ways, but your body is gonna fight back. And we're gonna talk about that. That's why it's so hard. Um, and then there's also the muscle cells, all right? And it turns out there's hormones coming from muscle cells that tell the brain what the status is. And so when we look at animal studies and animals who lose weight, they don't wanna exercise anymore. And it's very interesting. So sometimes I think when we feel tired and we don't want to exercise because we've been exercising and losing weight, it's physiology, all right? Because your body is trying to slow down, basically. So it's important to understand, and this is not all the feedback, but it gives you at least an idea. So what else influences eating and our weight? Well, one is the hedonic aspects of eating, right? So we were talking about homeostasis. We were talking about fuel and keeping your body steady in terms of hunger and hunger and appetite, et cetera. But there's a whole bunch of wicked wiring in our brain that causes us to really delight in certain foods and we want to super consume them, right? So we get craving for food, we like it, it feels like a reward at the level of our brain. And oftentimes it's hedonic eating that drives our eating beyond what we really need, all right? And I'm sure it's there to protect us, right? Um, this is what happens in the food industry. They know that rats will cross an electric field to get Doritos and Oreos because those are super palatable foods. Foods are constructed very specifically to get us to keep eating them, right? Because it's targeting parts of our brain. And then there's other aspects, right? We live in an environment, food is totally readily available, right? It's saturated with lots of calories. And that's actually what happens. People's brain lights up after they start losing weight. Even if they weren't even interested in certain foods before, your body knows exactly where to go to get the calories, right? Because we need to eat to survive. And that's what makes things more complex, right? And we also know, as you can see from these little, we're filled with stress, especially in the DC area, right? We don't follow any circadian rhythm. We're up all night, we're on the computer, we don't sleep, we don't walk, we drive around, et cetera. So if you think about it, there's a lot of environmental influences that affect the brain and the brain's decision whether we're eating or not, et cetera. So this is just a statement, but this is a very common statement, right? I've lost weight several times, but I just can't maintain it, all right? And every time I regain, sometimes I'm even higher than I was before. And many of you, this may resonate with you. This is not uncommon. And this is because of the physiology of that drive. And this is kind of, you'll see this curve a lot, but I'm going to show you a couple of different things, but people lose weight and then they gradually regain it over time. All right. The trajectory or the rate at which we regain can be fairly steep or it can be slow depending on what we do. And this little green line is just normally, it's very normal as we get older, we, woo, something's happening with my slides. We regain, we gain weight as we get older. We lose muscle mass and we gain weight. And that's a normal part of aging. And for women, they go through menopause. There's a redistribution of weight where a lot of the weight goes higher up, which is why we see things like sleep apnea and things like that um, during perimenopause and menopause. But there are physiologic adaptations that occur that allow this regain. And we're going to talk about a couple aspects of that. So what happens after weight loss? Well, what happens is we get hungrier, we get more cravings, and we feel less full. And we know this from endocrine studies looking at hormones of the same people before weight loss, immediately after weight loss, and even a year later. So there's alterations of hormones that the hormones that used to keep us full and tell us we were satiated, they go down. Hormones that make us hungry go up, right? Leptin goes down and tells the brain that we need to hang on to fat stores. And so there also is something called adaptive thermogenesis, where now after we've lost weight, we burn less calories, right? So we burn less calories because we weigh less, but we also burn less calories disproportionately because your body is trying to go back to where it was. 
This is very hard to understand for a lot of people. So if you think about it, it's the perfect storm. You're hungrier, you're not as full, and you don't burn as many calories, and you're kind of tired, and you don't really want to do anything. And so all of those things really don't add up very well, right? And it makes it very complicated. So this is one of the reasons why the development of medications to target these pathways can help not only with weight loss, but for maintenance to sustain the weight that's lost in an effort to improve those conditions. But this has been documented over and over. There's lots of changes that happen after weight loss, and it's not just about willpower. And the other thing that I want to know, just comment on briefly, what happens is what I was saying is that not only does your metabolic rate decrease, your basic metabolic rate, but you just do not burn as many calories after you've lost weight. So I need to move this along so I can talk about Wagovi and Sexenda because that's what I wanted you to see. But you can see there's a lot of different aspects here of things that are going to impact the rate of weight gain and the rate that are the things that affect maintenance. So what is the deal with pharmacotherapy? As I said, pharmacotherapy is really starting to target the adaptations that happen. And we know that when you target pharmacotherapy using medication plus lifestyle changes, those things together actually result in the most weight loss, right? And I'm gonna show you some data from that. And I think what happens for a lot of people with medication is it helps you see the action of all the things you've been trying to do all along, but your body's sort of been thwarting you, right? It makes it easier to eat less. It makes it easier to manage your cravings, et cetera. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And this is just a curve where this is behavioral alone. And this, this is done like in a research unit. This isn't just free form. So that's why you're getting say 6% weight loss with lifestyle alone. And this is with the addition, in this case, it's liraglutide, where you can see you can double the amount of weight you're losing by using medicine plus lifestyle. How do, whoops, sorry. How do people feel when they're on medicine? So I've been working with people for a long time. I've been doing research for about 20 years with these drugs, all different drugs. But mainly what people really notice is for the first time, they can just stop halfway through something, they eat it and they're kind of done. And they're actually really done. They're not fighting their body to say, yeah, I kind of want some, but yeah, I shouldn't have some and blah, blah, blah. All the kind of cognitive stuff that goes on in your head when you're wrestling with it, it changes. Cravings change. Sometimes people for the first time will actually feel hunger. You know, people all respond very differently. There's a lot of variation in what drives people's appetite but they just start to feel, as they say, kind of normal. It just, they don't have that weight of wrestling all the time with thinking they want to eat something, but they can't eat it, et cetera. There are a lot of different medicines. All the primary medicines that are, that are, that are mostly effective are targeting the brain, all right? These are the drugs we're going to focus on, liraglutide and semaglutide. They're GLP-1 agonists, glucagon-like peptide agonists. And we're going to talk about where they come from, but they're also targeting these pathways in the brain. Phentermine, topiramate, phentermine, naltrexone, bupropion, they all target the brain. Another key concept, I didn't mean to change the slide, but that's fine. It's very, this is a little bit difficult to see, but the main take home point, okay, is that each individual has a different response to these medicines. So when you see research or you hear people talking about certain things, Everything is reported as an average. This is something called a waterfall plot and it's plotting individual data from a trial. And what you can see is for some people, and this is with Contrave, for some people, they only lost a couple percent points, but then you had some real outliers, right? Who lost 35% of their weight. There are individual responses to every single intervention. Down here, this is Orlistat plus a reduced fat diet. You can see that a few people stay about the same. On the average, people lost 6%. But again, you have some people who are losing 25%. And over here on the right, that is with gastric bypass. You know, a lot of people don't realize that there are some people who don't actually lose much weight with gastric bypass. So more people lose a fair amount of weight. And you can see here on the average, if you can see my pointer, people are losing 35, 40% more weight, right? But here's a bunch of people down here that aren't 
losing very much. People don't realize that. And some people regain after their gastric bypass. And you may have a friend or somebody that did. So the key message about this is individual responsiveness. You have to match the person to the medicine. All right. And a lot of people don't understand that at all. And this is just my little funky diagram, but we'll move on is that what I think is that medicine can really just help a person take action. And as you get change, that enables more change. As you feel better, as you start to lose weight, you can move more. When you move more, you feel better and you make a different choice, right? Et cetera. So a lot of times these medicines not only are working physiologically, but help behaviorally because they inspire you to kind of keep going. All right. And to make those changes, because we know you need the combination of things. And a lot of this hooks into your own self-care and taking care of your health. So let's move on to the GLP-1 agonists. I'm going to talk about liraglutide and semaglutide, which is known as the brand names Saxenda and Wagovi. In research and medicine, we're encouraged to just talk about generics. But for patients, what you guys hear about are brand names. So I'll probably be flipping back and forth constantly. I finally, after all these years, taught myself generics, and now I got to go back to brand name. But anyway, so let's talk about liraglutide. So first of all, GLP-1s, glucagon-like peptide ones, is a hormone that comes from the gut, all right? But we all have GLP-1s. We make GLP-1s, all right? And GLP-1 normally in our own body signals to us that we're full after we eat. However, people can have variations on how sensitive they are to that. But you can see just by this diagram, the only thing you have to see is the GLP ones that we have interact in a lot of different places in our body. And I don't think a lot of people even realize that. So it can signal, and we're going to really focus on brain, stomach, pancreas, and gut. All right. But mostly brain. Okay. But it has impact on the heart. It has impact on kidneys. It impacts the immune system. It's, it's what we call ubiquitous. It's around, it's doing a lot of stuff. Okay. But we're going to talk about the medicine that was generated after we learned about this, but we all have our own GLP one. It just doesn't last long. It's broken down by enzymes and it doesn't hang around a very long time. Okay. And we'll talk about it in a second. This is totally complicated slide. Ignore all that. What I really want you to understand is that GLP ones act in the brain within the brain and it impacts signaling on craving and reward pathway, but it also acts in the gut in response to eating. So when we eat food, it's what we call an incretin, all right? And because of the response to food, it signals a response to insulin to help deal with the food, all right? So it has a gut response and brain action. It's acting primarily in two places, which is what we're gonna talk about with medicine, okay? So up here at the top, this is the normal, this is what we have, native, meaning our own human GLP-1. And the difference with these medicines, Saxenda, the sort of earlier one, they altered the molecular structure. So it hangs around instead of, I, it's like a few minutes, it's degraded right away. It hangs around for 13 hours, all right? and it's a daily injection, all right? Semaglutide, which is Wagovi, which is the sort of the next generation of this type of medicine has been altered. So now the half-life is even longer. You can see the half-life is 165 hours, approximately a week, all right? They are nearly identical to the hormone we have. It's just, they've been engineered and synthesized so that they hang around longer and they can act longer on things like appetite, insulin sensitivity, et cetera. There will be no test at the end of this, all right? So let's talk about Saxenda, three milligrams. It is approved for the treatment of obesity. It's a daily injection. It's been around for several years. It has a, a counterpart name called Victoza, which is used for type two diabetes. Victoza was first, and then it went through study to be approved for obesity at a higher dose. Let me explain the reason why these are separate situations. The FDA sees diabetes and obesity as two separate entities, right? All of the development of these drugs start with diabetes 
and they make sure it's safe with diabetes and that it improves blood sugar. And as they started studying it, they found that it was associated with weight loss. So then the FDA required them to do separate studies for weight loss. It was also found that people at higher weights needed higher doses on the average. All of this is average stuff. And so there are two different drugs, two different names, two different approved dosing levels, because that is an FDA requirement. All right. And they've tested on different populations of people. Just keep that in mind in the background. But anyway, let's talk about liraglutide. So these are just some fancy curves, but basically over on the left with liraglutide daily injections, on the average, you can see about 8% weight loss. All of these trials that I'm going to show you and talk about, you have to understand that the average person in these trials weighed 233 pounds, all right? with a range of up to an additional 46 pounds. So we are not looking at people who are 10 pounds overweight. We are looking at people who on the average are 60 to 70 pounds overweight. This is really important to understand because there's been a lot of hype about Wagovi and Ozempic and people using stuff who have to lose 10 pounds or people in Hollywood who don't have to lose any weight but wanna lose weight or whatever. It's very, very important that you understand who it was actually looked at. And it was looked at this population because these are people who have all of these different complications of obesity, and it's because we're trying to treat them medically. So just throwing that out there. But anyway, all of these are averages. And if you remember that other picture I showed you with a bunch of different medicines, you can have people lose on the average 8%. Some people might lose 20%. Some people might not lose anything. And you always have to keep that in mind. So these are averages. What we see with liraglutide, there was a maintenance trial where people lost 6% first. You had to lose 6%, and then they got re-randomized to either go to placebo, where they were able to keep that weight off, or they, went, they continued liraglutide, and you can see they actually lost an additional 6%. So this group of people who could do lifestyle and lose 6% really benefited from the addition of medication, and they were able to lose 12% of their weight loss. Now, this is very exciting for us because in the old days, we were very excited to even get 5% weight loss, all right? So this was a big deal for us. Everything is in the shadow of Wagovi at the moment. The other thing that's very important with GLP-1 agonists is that in this scale trials, looking at liraglutide, we saw at the end of the trial, many less people who started with prediabetes had prediabetes. We saw normalization of their glucose. Because GLP-1s, as you may have heard me say, were approved first for diabetes. So we see improvement of prediabetes with these drugs because it increases insulin secretion from the pancreas and improves your blood sugar. And we saw a decreased number of subjects moving from prediabetes to diabetes. So we could slow the progression to diabetes with these types of medicines with GLP-1 agonists. So I'm just throwing it out there. There's two things really going on with these types of drugs. You can help people move from prediabetes to normal blood sugar and as well as lose weight and decrease the risk of developing type two diabetes. A couple other neat things about liraglutide, which will probably end up being very similar for Wagovi, but it's just, these are the studies that are there. One of the things is it's not just about weight, it's about decreasing inflammation. So we know that GLP-1s can decrease inflammation. And in this trial, they looked at women who are about 70 to 80 pounds overweight, 50 years old. And these red lines over here are those that had lir liraglutide or sexenda. And in the blue lines, they had placebo. And in this study, what they looked at is visceral fat, the fat that's around the organs, the fat that causes diabetes, that causes fatty liver, the fat that gives us a lot of problems. All right. There's two kinds of fat. There's subcutaneous fat, which, you know, doesn't look so good in our clothes, but there's visceral fat, which is more dangerous. Okay. Because it actually is associated with all the metabolic problems. And what we see very nicely here with liraglutide is many, many more people with liraglutide were able to decrease that fat that's around the organs. All right. And you can see down here, there was a minus 12% they decreased their visceral fat by 12% compared to placebo, which was much less, about 
So be thinking about, it's not just about weight loss, it's about decreasing inflammation, it's about improving cardiovascular health. That is actually our goal. It's not to help people get into a swimming suit. Okay. The other thing that's a really important key concept to understand is exercise plus these medicines improves your health. All right. So here in this, and I'm not going to go through the whole study, but everybody lost weight. Then they were randomized to either, oops, I'm sorry. Most important thing is to see here, this reddish colored line is using exercise plus liraglutide. So what you see is when they added medicine, those that added medicine were able to lose a little more. And those who had medicine plus exercise, their weight dropped more and they were able to sustain it better. You can also see that those who didn't exercise after the intervention gained weight, all right? And that's the normal state of event. So exercise, when I was showing you that picture, there are hormones that come from the muscle cells that tell the brain, this is like the new place. It's not just about burning calories, but it's also about signaling, hormonal signaling to the brain. So exercise is, is actually giving a lot of different feedback to the brain, all right? And it's just important to keep in mind that. And then they also showed that people who exercised and used the medicine, a greater number of people were able to achieve 15% and 20% weight loss. So it's just underscoring the importance of exercise. But obviously for many of you, you have to lose weight in order to feel better to exercise, right? Or to get your knee replaced or to do whatever. But you don't need to do crazy exercise. Walking is fine, working in the pool, et cetera. So let's talk about semaglutide. Wagovi well, is the drug that's approved for obesity. Ozempic is not approved for obesity. It's not approved for weight management. And I don't know how the excitement all got started about Ozempic, probably during the Wagovi shortage, but it's really important to understand. It is the same chemical, but it's dosed differently with a different dose ranging. Even though it's logical, your doctor is not able to say you have prediabetes and get Ozempic. A lot of the people who got Ozempic probably somewhere along the way, someone said they had diabetes, which you have to be very careful and think about whether you want that label on healthcare. I'm from an old day where prior, um, whatever, you know, prior diagnoses could impede you from getting uh, any kind of health insurance. Now, right now we don't have that, but I don't know if we'll go back to that. So you do have to be careful. People are misusing these names all over the internet, all over everything else. So I'm just letting you know. Wagovi is the one that's approved for obesity. It is dosed as a single dose pen. Now this is a wide range of studies, but the net point of this is there are many step trials. We participated in, I don't know, three or four of these. We've had a lot of these trials. You can see here, this blue bar, you can see the average weight loss in these trials, 16 point, whoops, sorry. 16.9%, 17.6%, 18%, 16%. This is why everybody kept saying Wagovi was such a you know big deal, why it was a game changer, all these things. Because in the old days, we were very excited if we could get 8%, 7%, 5%. But now for the first time with semaglutide or Wagovi, we're able to get 15, 16, 17, 20% of weight loss for many people. And on the average, people are able to lose 15%. Keep in mind though, that the average starting weight for the, all of these step trials with the exception of the East Asian population, people were starting at a weight loss of around 230 pounds, which means about 70 excess pounds of weight. And they lost an average of about 35 pounds. This may have been disappointing to some of those people because they wanted to lose 70 pounds, but with the weight loss of 35 pounds, they were feeling so much better for functioning, improved, et cetera. So these are just things to, to keep in mind, but there's a lot of step trials. There will be more. This is one we participated in, which was actually a head-to-head -head comparison between semaglutide or Wagovi, as you can see here, 17%, and Saxenda, liraglutide, which people lost 6.6%, and then placebo lost 1.8%, all right? This was a head-to-head. Now, there were some people here who lost 20%, but it was a much smaller number of people, okay? 
Peanut, we're at 745. I'm just doing a time check for you. Yeah, yeah. So I will. No, no, you're fine. You're fine. I just, just, you know. Yeah, no, I want people to ask questions if they have questions. Anyway, so we saw a decrease in waist circumference in these trials. We also see improvement in blood pressure, right? That's something to keep in mind. This medicine can sometimes cause a decrease in thirst as well. So you have to watch your hydration and we'll talk about side effects in a second. Um, but with the decrease in blood pressure, if you feel like you're having lightheadedness or dizziness, you need to tell your doctor because he or she is going to need to adjust your medication. This is a well-known fact with GLP-1s, um, but we really see it with semaglutide because I think it's a duality of losing more weight and the GLP-1 action seems to lower blood pressure. We see improvements in triglycerides, improvements in blood sugar, and improvements in fasting insulin. And this is just a little diagram to show you what happened. This is a two-year trial with semaglutide. And you can see here in the beginning, half the people had prediabetes and half the people had normal blood sugar. And this is the distribution in placebo. And then what you can see happens is of the half that had prediabetes, nearly 80%, the green, became had normal blood sugar in those using semaglutide. So the majority of people shifted to a normal blood sugar, where of the placebo group, you can see that many still had prediabetes, a few developed diabetes in the red, and a smaller portion were normal. And this is two years. This is working with a dietitian every single month on lifestyle and exercise and all that kind of stuff. So what it shows us is that the augmentation of these changes with medicine does help what we're doing with lifestyle. And these are people who are getting lifestyle every day. I mean, every, you know, every week. This is just something to show over on, whoops. It's not a big deal. You guys probably would know this intuitively. As you lose more weight, you get better physical functioning, right? And those who lost more weight with semaglutide had better physical functioning. And this was just asking questions. Are you doing better bending, et cetera? We do know, and I'm just gonna summarize some of these slides. We know that semaglutide targets craving pathways. And they looked at this in a two-year trial and what they saw over two years, the people on semaglutide had better control over craving, their mood was better. They had better craving for less cravings for savory foods and less craving for sweet. Although by the end of two years, sweet was sort of drifting um, as we would expect. And hunger does come back, right? So um, you do really need to work with the behavior and lifestyle stuff as well. Now, these are the key questions. What happens when you stop semaglutide, right? We have data to show. Here's people in the blue line. They lose weight. They come off medication. They followed them for a year. And you see the gradual regaining of weight. Okay. People who were on placebo the whole time very slowly drifted back to baseline. People who had been on semaglutide a year later, some people were still able to keep five, six percent on the average off. Some people probably kept more off. Some people probably regained all the way. We don't have data about were these people exercising? What were they doing? There is more information that will be coming now that we have drugs that can give us more weight loss. We'll be able to look at maintenance and understand. Do people need to stay on medicine forever? How long do they need to stay? What do they need to do? What we do know is in the two-year trial, people are able to keep that weight off. This was in the step five trial, which was a two-year trial that we did. And you can see they lost here about on the average about 17% and they were still staying down while they continued medicine. And if you think about that, that makes sense. We talked about the physiology. We talked that these drugs are targeting the brain to keep the weight off. And if you stay on the therapy, then it will keep your weight down. This may seem self-evident, but in the old days, we had medicines that even though you were still taking the medicine, little by little, you were drifting up, right? And that's what's, that's what's really important. So this was a big deal as well. There will be five-year data coming out probably in the fall sometime for cardiovascular safety. So these are the typical side effects that you see with GLP-1 agonists. They're not much different from semaglutide or loraglutide nausea, constipation, diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal pain, all very, very common. Usually you see it when you change doses, when you go up on doses. Sometimes people see reflux. Sometimes that actually gets better 
uh, afterwards, after you lose weight, there's less pressure, fatigue, headache. An increase in heart rate is very common with these drugs. Um, and that's something that if you feel palpitations or something, you should tell your doctor that you're feeling that. It is not thought to be a negative about the heart. Um, the way the drug works, it can stimulate the heart beat to be a little bit faster. However, it's really important that your doctor checks that out. It can lower blood sugar. So if you have type two diabetes and you're on other medication to lower your blood sugar, you will need to adjust those medications when you add this type of medication. I cannot underscore this the most. You gotta pay attention to that and presumably your doctor will be paying attention to that. It can decrease thirst. If you get a lot of GI stuff, diarrhea, vomiting, you have to pay attention to hydration and make sure you're hydrated and let your doctor know. There is a risk of gallstones and pancreatitis with these drugs. Um, there is a contraindication for multiple endocrine neoplasia, which we don't really need to go into. You should not take this if you're pregnant or if you're nursing or if you decide you wanna be pregnant. And if you're losing weight to get pregnant, you must stop Wagovi or if you're using Ozempic off the record or whatever, two months before trying to conceive. The drug is around for two months. It has a week long half-life and it's gonna be hanging around and be there for a long time, okay? Um, and then you can work with your doctor about adjusting the dose slowly. Stop when you feel full so that you don't get sick. Certain foods can be adjusted. Um, foods that are higher in fat, spice, seems to decrease the interest in alcohol for some people as well. And you can work with your doctor for that. The biggest thing is these medicines automatically decrease your intake. So it's more important for you to look at the quality of your food. Don't try to do crazy dieting with these medicines. It's more important to get good quality food and good nutrition. Because for many people, their calories actually go fairly low. And so you don't wanna do this with some kind of other interesting diet. Um, you really just wanna focus on working with the nutritionist and working with lifestyle stuff. So you can see we're moving things along to the future. And I think I better stop and see if we have any questions. So I wanna thank you for your time. Hopefully it was helpful. So much information. Thank you so much. A lot of information. That was, that was love, I just love it. I, yeah, I mean, I have a bunch of questions. I think what we'll do is we'll just jump into what, um, yeah. what some people are saying here. I think, um, so just a question about um, medullary um, thyroid cancer. So I guess that there's an absolute contraindication for patients who have a history of the medullary thyroid cancer. Someone's asking, can patients who have had papillary thyroid cancer take them? Um, yes, if you've had papillary thyroid cancer and your cancer is stable, I mean, anybody with active cancer, you need to talk with your doctor, but there's not thought to be any kind of risk for the other thyroid cancers. Uh, multiple endocrine neoplasia is actually rare However, weirdly enough, I just saw somebody with that. And so if you have a history of kidney stones or someone's looking at something called hyperparathyroidism, you really need to talk to your doctor about looking for other endocrine issues, but it is very rare. It's not associated with other cancers, thyroid cancers. And then there's a question that I'm, I'm not quite sure of. It says, is that diabetes medication that daily and or weekly meds? I'm not sure what that is. Maybe the person who wrote that could, could restate that. I'm just not sure what that question is. Um, there's another question about what is a good way to measure whether or not you are obese? So, so tell us, talk so, about, you know, BMIs. I mean, is that something yeah, to measure? So, what? so I think, so first of all, you can talk with your doctor, you can calculate a BMI. A BMI is relatively helpful. I mean, the what we use as an indication of obesity is a BMI of 30. Anybody can go on NIH, like there's an NIH calculator, there's various calculators. What a BMI is, is just looking at your weight relative to your height. And everybody always likes to talk about the bodybuilders, the super athletes, but generally if you're asking the question, probably you're not one of those people. However, Waist circumference actually is really, really, really helpful. And you really, it's important to look at your waist circumference because we know that waist circumference is an indication of that visceral adiposity, the fat we were talking about in your belly that causes a lot of problems. So women should have a waist uh, less than 35 and men should have a waist less than 40. When you measure your waist, you measure it from the top of sort of your top of your pelvis, 
So if you can feel your bone there and go across your belly button, it is not where you wear your pants. Many men get very upset because it's not where they wear their pants because many men wear it under their belly, all right? Waist circumference is probably the most helpful. There's plenty of charts, um, but I think it's good if you have your doctor help you look at the context and help you decide how much weight <clears throat> you need to lose. I would say that just from my perspective, being um, a you know, physician who's, just, who's prescribing these medications, a lot of times the insurance companies will dictate, you, know, you have to be a certain BMI in order to qualify well, for taking the medicine. Well, the, the drugs are approved based on that protocol. Yes, exactly. Right? And so, so that's, that's kind of, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you have a BMI of 27, which is uh, you're overweight by about a little bit more than 20 pounds, plus you have something like high blood pressure or diabetes or hypertension, then you would qualify. Otherwise, if you don't have any of those complications, if you're about 30 pounds, 35 pounds overweight, then you would qualify to use these medicines. And you can see that the average person had twice as much that in this trial. Does that help? Um, can they, you mentioned something about um, heart rates going up a little bit on this. Can it trigger arrhythmia such as AFib or a flutter? It's a question it did there. Not, it, it's a good question. It did not in the trials. Now we're gonna have cardiovascular outcome data in the fall. Um, and that's 17,000 patients with cardiovascular disease. And so we'll have that, but so they did not see any arrhythmias associated with it. It was a sinus rhythm and it was just an increase in average heart rate by three to five beats per minute. Um, so it wasn't profound, but there were some people that went up over 20 uh, beats per minute. Thank you. Um, a question actually Creighton's asking this, could a Zepix popularity come from their seemingly large advertising budget? It seems like every other commercial on TV is for Ozempic. Or, 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 or I guess maybe it's a Wagovi who's, they would well, be the ones that they're advertising. I, so what happened was because there was a Wagovi shortage, because there was a supply chain issue with the dosing, the, the plastic of the pens, and there was something else with the, one of the factories, because there was a Wagovi shortage, I think what happened was is that somehow people started kind of going after Ozempic, knowing that it was the same drug, et cetera, or people who started Wagovi then flipped over to Ozempic because a lot of people got started because of a coupon. And the problem was the insurance companies didn't cover it anymore. So people started it for six months. And then I think some of them switched over to Ozempic. And yeah, probably the OOO Zempic song didn't really help much. <laughs> That's true. Um, question, does Munjaro, <laughs> does Munjaro work in a similar fashion? So Munjaro is, I would say, next generation type drug. It works on GLP-1 receptors, but it also works on something called GIP. And so uh, GIP used to stand for gastric inhibitory peptide, and they've changed the meaning of the acronym. But nevertheless, now it's targeting two hormones, all right? So Munjaro is approved for diabetes. It is not approved for obesity. And again, I don't know how all these people went on Munjaro. Um, anyway, nevertheless, Munjaro, there is data for obesity. It's going through the same procedure like a semaglutide did because the FDA wanted separate trials. And so it will go before the FDA, I don't know, sometime this year, we hope, uh, and it'll go under a different name and, it, and hopefully it will be approved for obesity and we'll have an additional thing. So similar-ish side effects, um, at least a profile, because again, you're targeting two gastrointestinal hormones and there will be some overlap. Um, how it'll all work out, we don't know yet. Um, I, you mentioned a little bit of this, other um, long-term effects such, um, on Succenda or Wagovi, people who've been that for a long period of time. What are the, what are the length of the um, studies that, that we have so far on these? Well, so, so far, um, Saxenda is approved for three years, although I think it's been used longer than that, certainly for diabetes in the lower dose of Victoza. Um, and for Wagovi, there is no end point from a chronic weight management. The FDA did not put one. There's not even a stop in terms of percentages of weight. The longest right now that has a, the longest study right now is two years, but the five-year cardiovascular outcome trial is due in September. And so we'll have data specifically for weight loss. From a diabetes standpoint though, the exposure has been much longer. 
because both Ozempic and Victoza have been used 10 years. Uh, Ozempic maybe eight years, but Victoza is probably 10 years for diabetes. So we don't see any signals emerging in that population. And people with diabetes and obesity typically are sicker in general uh, than people with just uncomplicated obesity. So right now there's no safety signal in terms of some issue with chronic exposure. But I mean, obviously they've only been around so long. Tuned, but hopefully every, everything right now looks looks safe. Yeah, and so I, that's, but that's I think it's good. also important to look at the population that we that we studied in, them, right? Um, do, uh, are either of these covered by insurance? Great question. A lot of it depends on your so, insurance, I guess. <laughs> it depends. It really largely just depends on the insurance. The federal employees, for the first time starting in January, people who have Blue Cross Blue Shield for federal employees seem to be getting good coverage. Um, for weight management uh, medications and for Wagobi and for Sexenda. Some of the other um, ones are not covered as well for EPP. I don't know why. Cigna, it doesn't seem to be very good in United Healthcare. Um, someone told me GIHA is covered. Um, you have to just kind of plod through. Everybody requires a prior authorization. Uh, little by little, we seem to be increasing coverage compared to even two years ago coverage seems to be better, but there still are some holdouts. Uh, Virginia Medicaid has actually covered my understanding, um, but Medicare is not covered. Um, so a lot of it is you're going to just have to talk to your insurance carrier and see if they cover um, exactly. weight, weight management or obesity medicine treatment. Um, no, so you just have to prescribe it to an authorization and then see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it's tough. It, there's a lot of hoops to jump through, that's for sure. Can I just um, say the Ozempic face thing? That is just a bunch of nonsense that happened on TikTok. Anyone who loses weight, okay? If you lose a lot of weight, your face is going to look thin for a while. It's going to look gaunt. I don't know yeah. why they started that. I, they I, somebody I, thought it was funny, and now everyone is terribly worried about it. But about his face. <laughs> I haven't really seen if there's a question on there or not. But yeah, it's in the chat. Sorry. Oh, it's in the chat. Oh, you, you saw that. Yeah. The, Chris uh, mentions, glad you acknowledge that depression and excess weight go hand in hand. Also, there's a very large stigma with excess weight. So that's just, you know. Yeah. And the other thing yeah. I would say so, from a depression standpoint, it's really important um, if you do have a certain amount of depression or had a history of depression to talk about it with your doctor, because you know sometimes when people lose weight, they think that everything they're depressed about is their weight. And then they find out that not everything gets better with that. And sometimes we do know that when people lose a lot of weight, sometimes depression can get worse, like with gastric bypass. And so it really is important that if you do feel like you've had depression or you're struggling mentally, do tell your doctor. It's really, really important because things don't always go exactly with the way we expect it. I don't think it's causal, but sometimes we find that we don't feel the same after we've lost weight or some, for some people having their appetite taken away. You know, I've had patients who are foodies and they love food and they're very, you know, gourmet about food and everything. And then they're just not interested in food anymore. And they're not sure who they are. So sometimes things are not what you expect it to be. So talk about that with your physician. I've heard, I've heard stories about that, which is why I think it's important as, as you're going through this process, also to have support, psychological support, and, um, and even nutrition support. And I think that's something that you offer also, Domenica, yes. in your program too. Because Absolutely. I think right now everybody's sort of coming and saying, oh, just put me on the medicine and I'll go on my way. And I think that there, there's just, there's so much more um, involved in that. And that's, it's, it's, it's a little bit scary for me as a primary care doctor and just hearing the demand and people are just thinking, you know, it's to start me on the shot and I'll be on my way, but it really, there's really a lot more to, um, there's obesity. a lot more to it. And if you want to do it in the healthiest way and a sustainable way, you need to actually work with all modalities. You know, you need to figure out how to exercise. And I really can't underestimate how, I mean, I really can't, whatever the word is, for, sorry, underscore. It's very, very important to get good nutrition. You don't want to go on a medicine that decreases your appetite and then just like, I don't know, eat a few cookies and be like, that's great. You know, you want to be careful that you're nourishing yourself for the calories you're taking in high quality food. And you really want to work with that and working those changes. So this is about self-care. It's not about wacky diets, you know? So, um, and a couple more questions. Wagovi program starts low, dosage goes up. 
That's just yep. sort of how, how, we, how we do it. Does the weight loss increase as the dosage goes up? Um, it can sometimes. Some people are really sensitive to lower doses. Typically, yes. Uh, the average so in, in all of these trials, you have to design a protocol a particular way. So you have to get to that dose, okay? Some people are what we call super responders. You don't need that much to actually get that effect. And also I would tell people to take their time in escalating up the dose. You don't have to be in some mad rush to get to 2.4. I would just try to use the drug as a tool to support you making behavioral changes to allow the weight loss and focus on your health, all right? This is a long-term problem with long-term use of medicine. So take your time is what yeah, I would say. Another thing, how long, what is the standard length of the program? Um, your entire life, <laughs> one would argue. Yeah, I mean, it's a chronic situation. You are going to have to be managing it. So, you know, none of these things are over the next day, unfortunately which everybody knows that because they've all been struggling with it, right? But everybody wants to fix it and I get it. But even with surgery, it's not an immediate fix, yeah? Um, okay, one of the slides discussed risks of diabetic retinopathy. Oh yeah, that's a very good question. So they did um, a step two trial. The step two trial was with diabetes, patients with diabetes. And um, patients that already had some retinopathy, um, there were a few, I think it was like 4% where it increased risk of getting worsening retinopathy. That's not specific for Ozempic or for Wagovi. It's actually for all GLP-1s. So we know people, so a couple of things are important for retinopathy. One is if you already have baseline retinopathy, I would talk about it with your ophthalmologist. Two, it depends on the change, the rip, the, how rapid your blood sugar goes from a high blood sugar to a low blood sugar we think that that aggravates retinopathy. So if you're someone with very poor sugar control, all right, where your A1C is, I don't know, 10, you wanna be very judicious, very careful, slowly lowering your blood sugar. We wanna get it normal, but we don't wanna do it overnight. All right, because sometimes that can aggravate retinopathy. If you know you have retinopathy already, then I would talk with the ophthalmologist and I would go very slow on these drugs. Just start 0.25, do it for a while and gradually get weight change and improvement in your blood sugar. If you're on other medicines to help your blood sugar, you'll have to work with your doctor because oftentimes when people start losing weight and take less calories in, you may need to cut your insulin more drastically. Or if you're on something called a sulfonylurea drug like glimepramide or glipizide, you may want to hold that drug while you do it because you don't want your blood sugar to come down too rapidly. So we'll take this as the last question because this is something yeah. to you know consider. Do you recommend seeing an endocrinologist for prescribing and managing this type of care? Or is a primary care doctor enough <laughs> not to be taken personally, of course? <laughs> so, so we've got the primary care doctor, we've got the endocrinologist. So <laughs> I mean, so first of all, I think it depends on if you have other endocrine diseases. And it depends on how comfortable your physician is with these medications. At the end of the day, it really depends on your doctor's experience and how comfortable they are, right? There are people that are obesity medicine specialists, but even within that spectrum, people have different degrees of experience. Some people have just taken a test, but they've never actually done it. And some people have lots of experience and the same with primary care physicians. So I would say that you talk with your doctor and see how comfortable they are. And if your doctor's comfortable, and I think really just little by little going slower makes more sense. Take your time, use the medicine to help you make the other changes. It's not a big rush, but I think it's more important to see the doctor that you feel the most comfortable with, that you can communicate how you're feeling and their level of comfort is probably at the end of the day, the most important. That's great. That's great advice. Well, well, I want to thank you, um, Domenica, Dr. Rubino, sure. for being here this evening. This is extremely sure. informative. Um, I think we could probably keep, you know, <laughs> keep, um, you know, talking about this and answering questions for hours. So maybe we'll have to have a part two at some point. But, sure. um, but you know, I really appreciate you taking the time and um, helping us understand this um, this kind of exploding world of new medications to help to um, help us manage the um, obesity epidemic and um, keep our weight in a healthy place. Glad to be of help. And I hope that answered people's questions or at least most of them. <laughs>
All and right. Come back if they have more questions sometimes. Absolutely. And then if you have any more questions, you can always, um, you know, we'll, we'll take whatever's left in the chat. We'll, we'll answer those questions if we can. And you can always reach out to to any of us at Northern Virginia Family Practice, um, if you have any other questions, and we can try to answer them ourselves or reach out to um, Dr. Rubino again. But um, thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. Um, I'm, you know, honored and um, just so happy that you've joined us and um, hope to see you again next month at our next town hall. So have a good one, everyone. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.